Matthew chapter 26. Jesus Christ, the uh, name of today's sermon is Light in a Dark World. And uh, I can remember when I was uh, first reading the Bible on my own. I tried several times growing up and would read little chunks, but the first time I really became enamored of the Bible uh, and just ate it up was in high school. And I remember reading through the Bible there and literally crying and weeping because there was so, this was goodness. There was goodness here. There was, there, was, there was purity. There was holiness. There was righteousness. There was something that was so in, in such a stark contrast from the, from the messed up world uh, that was all around us, all around me. And I thought, if only, if only we would surrender ourselves to this, if I would surrender myself to this, what a different place this world would be. But we don't. And in chapter 26, we see this darkness all over the place, a world we recognize because of its darkness, but then uh, light, this divine light, this light from God showing us something totally different. So we're going to read the entire chapter together today so we can see the story of Christ's earthly ministry coming to a swift conclusion. Everything's coming together right now. Uh, but before I start, I want to uh, encourage people to think how how would you respond if you had been in Christ's place? As we read through this chapter, I want you to be thinking, now what would I feel like? What would I do? What would I think? What would, what would my emotions be like? What would my response be like if I was in Christ's place? Think about it. It would be really hard to die for someone if their eyes are just overflowing and brimming with gratitude. They, they're so thankful. They know they're unworthy. And you're going to take their place. You're going to give them the transplant or whatever they need. It's going to be the end. Uh, it would be hard to die for someone who really, really was appreciative. Uh, and we know that they're going to take this gift of life and they're going to live a wonderful life. And it's going to be a selfless life. And they're going to live for other people. And they're going to live for truth. And they're going to live for beauty. And they're going to live for love and, and kindness. It would be hard to give your life to somebody who would respond in that way. Uh, but what if the people that you're dying to save, and again, some medical transplant, they each need a little chunk of your kidney or whatever, and I don't know, a little chunk of your gray matter. Uh, but anyways, you have to give your life for all these people. And they're laughing at you, and they're spitting on you, and they're mocking you. Oh, you think you're so good. Oh, you think you're going to save us. You came to suffer for these people, to die for these people. Uh, toss in the fact that there's going to be no anesthesia, and you're going to have to suffer one of the most horrible deaths known to mankind, utterly ungrateful. They think you're evil as you prepare to give your life for them. They think you're of Satan. They think you're uh, selfish. They think all these different things. And even your closest, that's the, the one group. That's the bad guy group. So then you have the good guy group. The good guy group, you know what? They follow you around. They think you're a good guy, but they grudge it. They begrudge you when you get too much attention. Somebody lavishes a little too much attention on you. They, they get uncomfortable with that. Uh, and they're really not with you in your moment of suffering because they're too busy arguing among themselves who's cooler, who looks cooler, who's more important, who has a more important job, who does more important things. Uh, they're arguing among themselves, see who's greatest, and they really can't sympathize with you. Multiple times you show them your heart. Guys, I really need you to be with me in this. Can you just sit up with me tonight? Can we pray together? And they keep falling asleep. Come on, guys, let's stay awake. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they go to sleep. Tomorrow, you're going to the operating table. You're giving your life for these people who can't even stay awake with you and pray with you, let alone the people that are 
uh, outraged at you and hate you, how would you feel? What would you do? So that's one thing I want us to focus on. How, how would we react if we were in Christ's shoes? And the second thing is to focus on the way that Christ answers the question, what does real life, what does real love look like? What does love look like? We talk about love. Theoretically, hypothetically, what does love look like? And Christ answers that question for us. So everybody turn to uh, Matthew chapter 26. Now remember, thinking about two things, imagine how you'd feel in Christ's place. And secondly, what is love? What does it look like? <clears throat> so please follow along with me as we read the word of God. When Jesus had finished saying all of these things, he said to his disciples, As you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way and kill him. But not during the festivals, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. While Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on the, his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him thirty pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparation for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table of the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say uh, to him with one another, Surely not I, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Jesus, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus answered, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not for drink of this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Jesus replied, uh, Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Then Jesus went with the disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over here and pray. He told Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. 
stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Then when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed a third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to his disciples and said, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. And again, remember, put yourself in Christ's shoes. How would you respond? You're giving your life for people that are so distracted. They grudge you any attention. They begrudge you any attention. Uh, they argue among themselves which one is greatest. They want the attention. They can't even stay up with you and pray with you when you say, I'm really hurting here. I need my friends to be with me. And the next day, you're going to give your life so that they could live. And then <clears throat> there's all these other people who hate you and are plotting against you and think you're evil and call you of Satan, and you are dying to give them life. How would you feel? What would you do if you were in Christ's shoes? And then tied into that question is we need to focus on what is love? What does it look like? How does Christ answer the question, what does real love look like? Okay, now let's continue on from verse 47. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived with him. W arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. This, uh, when it says a large crowd, it's a, it's a technical term which meant uh, quite a few people. And it, was, it was a Roman military term. And there was a, a group of Roman soldiers that were actually at the disposal of the high priest during festival times, so he could use them to control the crowd. Uh, but when it says, and with clubs or with staves, it probably means that they're also uh, rabble there as well. So it could have been uh, a, a Jewish mob or very possibly a mix of Roman soldiers with, uh, with uh, uh, just a crowd of, of Jews around them as well. Uh, they were sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. When the men stepped forward, seized Jesus and arrested him. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke were uh, written very early in the history of Christianity. So it says, one of Jesus' companions drew a sword and cut off the ear of the high priest. Well, we know from John that this was Peter. And probably, since John lived a long life and his was the last gospel, he uses his name only after Peter has been martyred. Because it would have been dangerous, maybe, for, for it to be known that Peter was the one who used the sword. We also know the name of this guy whose ear got cut off. His name is Malchus which is kind of cool. Why would that name be in the Bible? Is I think it's very likely that he becomes a believer himself, this servant of the high priest. The high priest sends this mob out to get Jesus, and it results in one of the men very possibly putting his faith in Jesus Christ. So this is the early text, and it doesn't say who did the cutting or the name of the servant, but later on uh, in Scripture we do see those names. Uh, Put your sword back in its place. Jesus said, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. All who die, uh, draw the sword will die by the sword. Uh, the Adam Clark commentary has this to say. It says, put up again thy sword into its place. Neither Christ nor his religion is to be defended by the secular arm, by secular weapons. God is sufficiently able to support himself. Uh, 
when God was holding up the ark, Uzziah did not need to stretch out his hand on that occasion. Remember, Uzziah was struck dead for disobeying the Lord, even though he tried to uphold the ark. Even the shadow of public justice is not to be resisted by a private person when coming from those in public authority. The cause of a Christian is the cause of God. Suffering belongs to the one in vengeance to the other. Let the cause, therefore, rest in his hands, who will do it ample justice. This morning in Sunday school class, we were talking about uh, how the disciples, uh, after Christ had gone in, in uh, Acts, the Sanhedrin uh, called them and commanded them, stop preaching the name of Jesus Christ. Do you remember what they said? They said, uh, you tell us, who should we obey, God or man? Because that was when government was specifically telling them to disobey the, uh, the will of God, the revealed will of God. When government tells us to disobey God, we always obey God and not government. But we are not supposed to uh, fight with earthly weapons. We fight with uh, the power of the Spirit that God has given us. And our hope is in the Lord, and our hope is not in the sword to uh, set the situation right. Uh, I've heard a lot of people say, we need to fix things. Not, I haven't heard a lot of people say, you see, you see it on the internet, okay, that's not a lot of people. I've seen some weird people on the internet, let's put it that way, say some weird things on the internet that we need to fix things and we need to pick up arms or whatnot, and I'm always saying, boy, they have no idea what anarchy looks like, how it would be to have a roving band of 10 or 20 young men armed to the teeth going and taking whatever they want. No, even a bad government, unless it's an atrocious government, even a bad government is better than anarchy. And Christ is saying very clearly, if you pick up the sword, you'll die by the sword. You want to live by the world standards? Go ahead. But we are supposed to change the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, change people's hearts uh, with love. I was uh, talking to somebody in, in juvie recently, and I said, uh, imagine how this place could be emptied out. Imagine how all the jails would just be empty. You know, what do we need? More police? What do you need? Better jails? You know, what, what do we need? Well, this sounds simplistic, but I'll to give you an idea. How about everybody falls on their faces before the living God says, I'm a sinner, I'm so messed up. I see your beauty, and I want to be like you. I want to live for goodness. I want to be like, our jails would be empty. We need people to turn to the living God, and we need revival in this country, and we need Christians who are willing and brave enough to speak out the truth of the cross, hold up the cross to everyone around them, uh, bring this truth to everyone around them, and let them know there's a real God, He really does love you, and you really need to get right with God, or it's not going to go well with you in eternity. You need to get right with God. Uh, our weapons are not the weapons of this world. All right, uh, where was I? Thank you. Put the sword back in its place, Jesus said. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my Father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Uh, probably he chose the number 12 because he had 12 disciples. Even Judas was there at that point. Uh, a legion in Roman terms was 6,000, but sometimes they had half legions, which is 3,000. So I don't know if Jesus was talking about half legions of 3,000 each or 6,000. The point is, is, listen, I have all the power I need. I can stop this if I want to. I'm not stopping this. Put away your little tiny sword. Uh, do you think I cannot call upon my father? He will not once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? That hour Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have to come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day in the temple courts, I was every day in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this has to take place, that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. You notice what Peter said, even if everybody denies you, I won't. And you know what he did? He went for that sword. Kind of got to give him credit in one sense. Things, there's this huge mob. They're not going to survive this encounter. He's ready to die fighting with Jesus. And so he whips out his sword. He's going to fight. And Jesus said, we're not going to do it that way. And he falls apart because he can't conceive of doing it God's way. And he tucks tail 
and he runs. He goes running because he's not willing to do it God's way. It's got to be his way or he can't handle it at this point in his life, right? He's going to change, right? But at this point in his life, he, he has no strength when it's not done the way he had imagined it to be, the way that he could handle it in his mind. And so all the disciples, just like the Old Testament prophesied, I'm going to strike the shepherd, the sheep are going to scatter, Jesus is arrested, and what happens? Disciples all go running. All right, uh, before we read the next little chunk from, from 57, actually we're going to read from 57 to the end, uh, I want to mention a couple things. Christ is about to go on trial. First, uh, from here on, some of the elements of chapter 26 are going to be in a different order or look slightly different than the way the other Gospels uh, describe them. Some people who are looking for an excuse to reject the Bible say, well, this order is messed up, or the people who are here are here. It seems a little different, and so they're going to chuck the Bible. Uh, it's funny because you can read it so that each person is giving an honest account. Uh, one is talking about different events. Maybe if there's a group of three people, one says this person said it, you know, and, and another person says a group of people said, some, said something. Uh, you can read it so that there's harmony between them. And so my point is, why wouldn't you expect, especially since they were written at different times, probably, uh, some people think Mark was first, and then Matthew copied large chunks of Mark because it was true, and Mark is actually, he wasn't a disciple, but a lot of er, the early church reported that he was uh, the, uh, the writer, the scribe for Peter, and so Mark is kind of the, the apostle, of Peter, uh, the, the gospel of Peter in a sense. Uh, others, other uh, people who study texts uh, think that Luke was first, then Mark. It doesn't matter, but whatever. They were not all written at the same time. They had access to one another. So why would they willfully contradict them when, when uh, obviously they had access because they're quoting back and forth and the early church is quoting from, from each one of them. Uh, instead, I think that we can see this as uh, they're recording what comes to mind next. Oh, this happened and then this happened. Other ones are filling in the details that the other uh, uh, gospel didn't. Really, honestly, everything here can be harmonized. So it's not, it's not a necessary contradiction when you see things in different order in different places. Uh, it's what looks like a contradiction, but if it can be harmonized, then, then uh, why say that it has to be that way? And we do this all the time in our own minds. Uh, let's say Cameron said that uh, the, other day, uh, the other day Rachel and I went to Madison. And then I said, wait, 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 wait. I heard that uh, the other day I heard about you having a conversation with, uh, with uh, mom and dad while you were in the car. These are contradictions. They can't possibly be true. Of course you don't think that way. We just say, well, there must be a harmonization there. You went with Rachel. You're talking about Rachel, so you mentioned it. But also mom and dad were in the car, and I heard about the conversation you had when you were together. See how that works? I mean, we do that all the time, and we don't say, well, there's a contradiction. We just say, oh, well, this is true and this is true, so how do they fit? And that just works with normal life. But for some reason, we treat the Bible like it's this special magic book that doesn't work like normal conversation works. Think about it like normal conversation works, and it tends to fit all together. So a couple things I wanted to mention. One is we're about to see one of Christ's several trials here. Christ's trial is illegal. What they did when they grabbed Christ at night in a different place, he says, you're coming at night, well, this is your time. Darkness reigns. Christ's trial is illegal. It takes place at night. Neither the Sanhedrin nor a court of law in Judea at that time could preside over a capital offense at night. And the Jews had this saying that uh, just like you need daylight to see the details of something, so you need the light of day to shine on a, a capital offense trial or whatever. It was, they said it cooler than me. But uh, you needed a capital offense, which they were wanting Jesus to get the death penalty, could only be tried during the day. Secondly, there's an interrogation and beating here, and it's done secretively, and that also was illegal under Jewish law. Uh, if there was an interrog interrogation, it had to be a public, it couldn't be secretive. And then the trial takes place the day before Passover, and no trials were allowed to be during Passover, so the Jews also said, you cannot have a trial the day before any festival uh, because otherwise there's this big gap 
because you weren't able to hold it during the festival before the trial can, can conclude. So, uh, you know, I just wonder if their own minds, they thought, well, they met with uh, Annas, who was not the high priest at that time, but the Bible calls him high priest. People, it's like you still call uh, President Clinton and President Bush president, even though they're not the president. You'd still call the high priest, Annas the high priest, even though he wasn't technically ruling at that time. Uh, and then there was a meeting with him. There was a meeting also with Caiaphas, uh, who was the high priest who was serving at that time. Not only the Bible tells us this, secular history confirms this uh, for us as well. Uh, maybe in their thinking, they thought these were just get-togethers, fact-finding opportunities. And the real trial was with the Rome, the Roman court with Pontius Pilate. And Rome doesn't have to obey Jewish law, so they could do this uh, during uh, festival time. I don't know what their... their their feelings were on that, but they were playing games with the law if that was their case. They know what they were doing was just maybe the letter of the law, but not strictly obedience to the law, which of course is, is sinfulness in God's eyes. Uh, another interesting point here is that there were two high priests, and I just mentioned their names, alive at that time. Annas, who was the first high priest set up by uh, Quirinius, uh, the uh, governor earlier, uh, maybe I think he stopped serving in 15 AD, uh, set up by Rome. So the high priests are set up by Rome, and he was actually the very first uh, high priest of the province of Judea. Remember, the Romans had taken Judea away from the Parthians, and they set up this province, and, and the Romans installed the high priest. Then the Romans took him down, and one of his sons served. And then Caiaphas, who's actually the son-in-law <coughs> of Annas, is now uh, the high priest, and he was appointed, I believe, by Pontius Pilate himself. So Caiaphas is serving. So the high priests are serving at the will of Roman occupiers. Now, how would that go over in our country if all the, the pastors were being employed in, in, in the serving at the behest of an occupying power? And yet, the Bible continued to tell the people to be respectful of, to the office of the high priest and to, to uh, be, obey the high priest and to serve uh, to, to do their duty and to tithe to the temple, even though the temple was controlled by people in, who were set up by, they were puppet leaders. And what's further, they hated Jesus, and Jesus commended people who offered their tithe to the temple because they weren't giving it to those nasty guys. They were giving it to God. And so Jesus put his stamp of approval on it. But here we have these high priests that are appointed by Roman occupiers uh, and there actually may have been a third high priest alive at that time. I'm not sure when he died, but that was Eleazar who served between Annas and Caiaphas. Eleazar was uh, Annas' son. After Caiaphas is deposed by Rome, four more of Annas' sons are going to serve as high priest. So one high priest and then four sons and a son-in-law all follow him. All right, let's uh, look from, uh, from 26. The reason I mention all that is because the Bible talks about two high priests, Annas and Caiaphas, and people say, how can this be? The Bible contradicting. There's an, how can there be two high priests? Well, I just told you how there can be. See? See how it looks like a contradiction, but it's not a necessary contradiction? You need to do a little research. Okay, uh, 57 uh, to the end. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter... Uh, followed him at a distance right up the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. And uh, later we know that John actually was an acquaintance or maybe even a relative of the high priest, and so he was able to go in. And he was actually able to bring Peter then into the courtyard. Uh, the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. They did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it up in three days. Remember, Jesus was walking through the temple and he said, I, If this temple is destroyed, I can raise it up in three days. And he was talking about the temple of his body. I'll raise it up in three days later. Finally, uh, two came forward and said, This guy was saying he could destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you again under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied, but I say to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One 
in coming on the clouds of heaven. He's equating himself equal with God the Father, and riding clouds was a position of deity in the Middle East. There's this idea of, of, of being divine, and he's going to come back on, riding on the clouds of heaven. The whole place went crazy. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look how you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. They spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Messiah. Who hit you? Jesus loves these people. Jesus is willing to die for these people. Okay, I asked you earlier, how would you feel if you were in Jesus' place and you were going to die for somebody and they were mistreating you? Well, I want to ask you another question. How would it be if you really want to watch your favorite TV show and somebody calls you who irritates you? I mean, most of us are not going to be called to lay down our lives to be Christ-like. Most of us are not willing to be called to to have to die to show God's love to other people. But how about when it's inconvenient? How about when that person really doesn't deserve you to be nice to them again? How about when they've said something that hurt your feelings? How about spitting and kicking you and, and saying, prophesy to us, Messiah, <laughs> as you're preparing to die for them, right? See where I'm going with this? We endure so little and are so hard and bitter so quick to bitterness, so unforgiving, so unlike God. This dark world stuff, we understand that. We live in a dark world. We have darkness in our own hearts. We understand revenge and, and getting back and, and making people suffer and making people pay. We get all that. And in the middle of this darkness, there's a guy who's being treated utterly unfairly. Has life ever treated you unfairly? Has your spouse ever treated you unfairly? Your friends, the people you thought had your back, let you down? Because we all do that to each other sometimes. Do you, do you think that that gave you a pass then to be really diabolical? Diabolical means kind of like Satan, right? Satan-like, Diablo. Do, do, do we get a pass to be really nasty because people are not nice to us? Because people are not fair to us? When you call yourself a Christian, it means that you want to be like Christ. Look at how Christ is treating, willing to die for the people who are being abusive to him. Prophesied to us, Messiah, who hit you? Then verse 69. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. How do we know this happened? Well, because Matthew heard it from Peter or John. Those were the two disciples who were in the courtyard. They're, they're explained to us what happened. The Bible is a wonderful book. In the Old Testament, the nation of Israel sometimes doesn't come across looking so well. Well, who wrote that? Jewish people, being honest about themselves before the living God. And in the New Testament, the disciples sometimes don't come across. If their, if their point was to make religion so they could be big deals, they did it wrong. They wanted to make a religion so they could bring a lot of attention to themselves and they could be so awesome. They did it wrong because they make Jesus Christ the only light in the darkness and they're admitting their failure here. So Peter was sitting out in the courtyard. This girl comes to him and says, you're with Jesus. He denies the one who loves him most. He denies the one who's willing to die for him. He denies the one who has spent all this time eating together, laughing together, walking together, doing ministry together, suffering, suffering hardship together, and now he's denying him because, Jesus, this isn't supposed to happen this way. Life isn't supposed to happen this way. I thought, boom, 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 boom. And we do that too, sisters, brothers. We do that with God. I thought my life would work out this way. I had it all lined up. And God, you're not doing it my way. I don't know you. God, you're not doing it my way. Therefore, 
I don't have to obey you. God, you're not doing, you're not doing things according to my expectation, so I'm not going to obey you in this. So that's because we look diabolical, like Satan, and not Christ-like. Everybody tracking with me? The difference there? Uh, 70. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. You're a Galilean. You're not from Judah. Uh, then he began, he began to call down curses and swore to them, I do not know this man. Immediately a rooster, a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. Yeah, I, I challenge you to find any mythology that reads anything remotely like Scripture. This reads like events that happened. And we all know it. We all know it. So, brothers and sisters, what does real love look like? Christ engages this issue by living out the answer. It's not just theoretical for him. He's living out love. He gives his rights away. Think about this. He gave his rights away, not just on the cross. He gave his rights away when he descended from heaven. He set aside his prerogative, set aside his glory. He's born in a manger. He's born as a helpless baby. King of kings, mighty God, Lord of lords, master of all creation, born as a helpless little baby. How, what kind of humility is that? Here, change my diaper, mommy. Setting aside everything that a mighty king uh, deserves. He gave his rights away when he descended from heaven. He gave his comfort away when he, by living a life dedicated to the kingdom of God and traveling. He didn't have a place to call his own. He had to find a stone to sleep on in the wilderness and going from village to village preaching the kingdom of God. He gave away his rights when he came down. He gave away his comfort to, to live for the kingdom of God. And now we see him giving away life itself. And while he's doing it, he is blessing and showing compassion on who? People that deserve it? Brothers and sisters, Jesus said, even a tax collector, even the Gentiles know how to treat people well that treat them well. It's not a Christian thing to be nice to the people that are nice to you. You don't need the Holy Spirit. Anybody can do that. How about when you get that, oh, praying, God, help me to show your love to this person. That person is totally unworthy of friendship. Lord, help me to be a friend to that person. This person lets me down all... Lord, help me to show them goodness. This is not something I'm good at. This is something Jesus is good at. It's something I want to be good at because I want to be like Jesus. People walking away from you. People don't uh, give you the respect you think they need. Uh, pe people ignoring you. Lord God, I don't want to hold on to bitterness. That's what the devil wants me to do. Lord God, help me to win their heart. Lord God, I want to show them love because that's the way you do it. Christians bent out of shape on an angry war path, making people for pray, pay for their crimes. How dare they treat me like that? How dare you, Christian, talk like that? We said this last week, but words like uh, ticked off and, and annoyed, they need to be lots less frequent on our lips. The, the caricature of the offended Christian running around with his head cut off all the time that doesn't look like Jesus to me. And we're called to be like Jesus. What does real life look like? Look what Jesus did. He took a lot of crap. He took a lot of abuse to show people love. He was willing to suffer and go out of his way for people that were mocking him, that had no, that had no desire to, to, to bless him in return. What, the, uh, you don't need to be a Christian to say, I'm nice to people who are nice to me, but they're going to pay if they think they could. Oh, yeah, yeah, 
That's the way the devil talks. Jesus showed us what love looks like by giving away his rights, giving away his comfort, giving away his freedom, and giving away his, uh, his life itself, showing compassion on unworthy people. Wife, wives, have the love of Christ for your husband. Husbands, don't love your wife when she deserves it. Don't love your wife if she thinks, if you, in all your majesty, think that she is somehow maybe perhaps getting worthy of you. Oh. Love them all the time because they're a daughter of the king. Christ made them. God made them. Love them. And if they're a Christian, they're your sister forever. How does God want you to treat his daughter? Selfless love. Christ calls us to follow his example of selfless love. Brothers and sisters, let's be very honest with ourselves. Our first bent is very selfish. Knee-jerk reaction, anger. How dare somebody do that? How, how, they can't treat me like this. They can't talk to me like this. I'm going to make them pay. That's not your job. The person who makes them pay is upstairs. Wrath belongs to the man upstairs. We're supposed to be his ambassadors. So brothers and sisters, show true strength. Pray to love people when they mistreat you. Let's say, I want to be like Jesus in my heart. We're going to fail. I'm not going to be the pastor I need to be. I'm not going to be the friend that you guys deserve. I want to be. You're not going to be the, the church that you ought to be. But we want to be shooting at the right target, right? We want to be more like Jesus. And when, when we fail at this, let's be quick to forgive, slow to anger. Let's not be writing off people because they forgot a meeting or whatever. Let's not write each other off. Let's learn to love each other. Let's learn to forgive each other. And let's all strive and say, in our hearts, I want to be more like Jesus. I really don't want to be like Satan. I want to be a blessing to the people around me. I do not want to be a curse to the people of this church. I do not want to be a curse to my wife. I do not want to be a curse to my children. I want to be a source of blessing for everyone around me because I follow Jesus, and he is a light in a dark world. Amen? Dear Lord God, help us to be lives, lights in, dark, in a dark world as well. We pray this in your name. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.